My beloved people, in this morning's bulletin, we begin already to uh, make note of Ash Wednesday, and that, um, which is, of course, a day of solemn fast and complete abstinence. It is not a holy day, but everyone is urged to attend Mass on that day if and when it is possible. And in these days and times, we certainly understand, and I know Almighty God understands, that it is not possible for a great number of faithful people. We will, however, have Masses at St. Francis in Coleman, and the Masses will be at 7 in the morning and 7 in the evening, and there will be distribution of ashes at both Masses. We will distribute ashes uh, in this church and um, on the following uh, Sunday. We begin also during the station, uh, during Lent to have the Stations of the Cross in Coleman and have benediction of the Most Blessed Sacrament on every Friday at 7 o'clock. We will bless throats this morning, uh, Saint, the St. Saint Blaise blessing. On the reverse side of the bulletin today, we uh, must make note and take note of the uh, regulations for Lent. First of all, we should always be mindful of the fact that what we do must be done because of what we see on our crucifixes. Let us look to the crucifix before we do anything, and let us try to have within our hearts that kind of sincerity which the crucifix manifests to us. It is the foundation of everything we do, it is the reason of everything we are, and it is for us, it should be our total fair, as it were, to speak. And we should pray during the season of Lent for the welfare of the kingdom of Christ on earth. During this year's Lent, I think that that should be our mission and our purpose. The enemies of the church are gathering all around us. Now let us do what we have to do in order to fight the enemy. Together of ourselves, we can't do this. The only way we can fight the enemy, whoever he is, wherever he is, and whatever he is, is through our prayer. And let us all remember that wherever we look, that any doctrine that makes a man quarrelsome is poor religion. And we cannot be quarrelsome. We will not be quarrelsome. We are going to pray. And our work is going to be prayer. And we shall fast and we shall abstain in the spirit of prayer. Now, how do we go about observing the Lenten observance? The first thing we should keep in mind is that we should observe the Lenten observance with good common sense. We should not go beyond what is expected of us as human beings, what is expected of us as Catholics. Almighty God, in Scripture, through the words of Christ, gives orders that we should do penance, that we should fast. But he does not tell us how or what to do. So this has been left to the church to tell us how and what and when to do. We should try always to remember that in so doing, we should not be more Catholic than the church. 
and that we should not do things over and above the prescribed measures which are normally prescribed by the church. Therefore, to do anything that might in some way injure our health or to do something which in any way impairs our ability to move and to work uh, should be looked at very, very carefully. Fast, yes. And we know the old regulation for fasting. One full meal and two meals which about equal the one full meal. Remember that in cooking in the house or preparing meals in the house, the one who prepares the meal should not force his or her way of fasting upon the other members of the family. Let the other members of the family make their own decisions about fasting and that we prepare the meals as would be normal for them to be prepared and not try to, if I want to do without this, doesn't mean that everybody in the family has to do without this, whatever it is. If I want to do without this, that's fine. Let the other people do without the things that they choose to do. So let's not prescribe ca uh, holiness to others. But God does not give us these orders how to fast. The church does. And of course the church also has the right to change its own laws if and whenever. Now we must fast under pain of sin on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. That's the present uh, legislation. We can go back to the old dispensation if you choose. You can do that and I, I recommend that we do some fasting. I know in the monastery we're going to fast every day. This does not mean that you have to fast every day under pain of sin. It is not under pain of sin that we fast. We fast because we want to fast. And that's the only reason. It is the gift to God is much more acceptable, wouldn't you suspect, if it comes from that which I want to do rather than what I have to do. So in fasting, let us keep this in mind. Uh, it is uh, to completely disregard, however, the whole principle of fasting, as so many are doing today. Now that is certainly sinful and cannot be doubted by anybody. The people today ridicule fasting, ridicule abstaining, and so on. Uh, this is certainly not above sin. So. We may eat meat at the principal meal when we're fasting. The principal meal can be the breakfast or dinner or supper. It makes no difference. It's not said which one it has to be. If you want to have your full meal in the morning, fine. Uh, the smaller meals can be taken at the other times during the day. Eating between meals, of course, is not permitted. But liquids, like including milk and fruit juices, uh, may be taken at any time in the fast day. So let us keep, if you keep this, um, keep this in front of you here, I think you will have no particular problems. Now with reference to abstinence, this can be a source of difficulty to so many of us uh, because we move about in non-Catholic circles, or move out in Catholic circles for that matter, and uh, the eating of meat for them is all right every day of the year. They might, excuse me, they might abstain on Good Friday uh, when the conscience begins to hurt a bit, or on Ash Wednesday. But for the rest, I'm sure they don't pay any attention to it. But we must not eat meat on Friday. And we must become accustomed to this, that we do not eat meat on Friday. Any Friday, particularly the Fridays during Lent. We must be particularly careful that we do not 
use meat to season things, our foods, on Friday or on days when meat is not permitted. Um, I know in former times the use of lard, which I don't think today is any problem, I don't think anybody uses lard anymore, uh, though it, uh, there's something to be said for it uh, by some people uh, for health reasons, but uh, the use of lard was forbidden and probably still would be, though some theologians maintain that the use of lard is permitted. Now, we may not use, however, uh, this is where some very fine distinctions come into play. We may not use extracts of meat, like your bouillons and things of that nature, on meatless days. So, uh, let us try to keep these things in mind, and let us try to live within the spirit of the law. That is what is going to get for us the graces that we need. And especially where children are involved, please try to teach them that it is not in the absence or in the forbidding or in the abstinence, in the negative. Fasting and abstaining is not negative. We are not denying ourselves the use of this or that simply for the reason of denying ourselves. We are not denying ourselves chocolate candy simply because we're just not going to eat chocolate candy. If, that's, if, if that is as deep as our religion is, it's not very deep. But I give up chocolate candy because I want to do something to show my love to someone who has given to me a lot more than chocolate candy. Fasting and abstaining is a matter of showing our love. If it's done for any other reason, don't bother. Eat all the chocolate candy you want or can buy because it's not doing anybody any good. But if I abstain from chocolate candy, it is because, dear Lord, I love chocolate candy. But I want to give you something, and I am not going to eat it because I want to prove to you how much I truly love you. And I love you more than I love chocolate candy. Of course, chocolate candy can be taken to mean anything in the world that you can think of. This is the very opposite of what the world is telling us. What is the world telling us? If you like chocolate candy, go out and buy up the market. If you like it, do it. That's the world. And the world is empty. What do we say? If you like it, say, dear Lord, I love you enough not to do it. It's all a matter of love. And we must understand this. And we should take heed of the magnificent epistles of these days that we're getting from St. Paul, who always has the right way of saying whatever it is in the proper way. And the word is being presented to us, and you must work, my beloved people, to understand what is meant by those dreadful dreadful words, lest seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear. How often have I mentioned to you, Satan sees the word, 
Satan hears the word. Satan knows the word. But Satan is not holy. Satan sees the word, but he doesn't see it. He has only the vocabulary to deal with. He hears the word, but he doesn't hear it. And so many of ours are just in that position, my beloved friends, and it is a tragedy that so many today are in that fix. And all they hear, if the world speaks, indeed do they hear it. If the world writes, indeed do they see it. Because that's the vocabulary that they understand. We are the chosen of God. And let us not ever, ever forget that.